Good morning and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 7th of August and this quick look ahead to the week beginning the 10th of August. And this week equity markets have seen a little bit of stabilisation. You may recall uh, towards the end of last week we saw some fairly big declines at the back end of the week over concerns about the resilience of the US economic recovery. And I think there was concern that um, particularly in the face of rising infections in the US Sunbelt that we may see a little bit of destabilization when it came to the US economic recovery. Now thus far this week we've seen US markets continue to go from strength to strength and obviously that's a fairly positive thing but uh, once again this, this strength in US markets has been primarily driven by the big tech, big, big tech giants, easy for me to say, the big tech giants of Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Alphabet, and what have you. So um, the S&P 500 is headed, is continues to head back towards those February all-time highs of just above 3,400, led pretty much by the nose, by the Nasdaq, which has continued to push higher and is significantly above the lows that we saw in July to the tune of around about 60%. So we've seen significant outperformance from the NASDAQ and that has helped support US markets. What I would say though is if you take those big tech stocks out of the overall equation, the US markets probably don't look as good as perhaps um, they, sh they should do on initial reflection and that's not no better borne out by the performance of the small cap, the US small cap index or the Russell 2000. Yes, we have continued to move higher, but certainly if you look at um, where we were, say for example, at the beginning of this year, we're still well short of there and even below the highs that we saw all the way back in 2018. So certainly once you strip away the veneer of the blue chips, the recovery in US stocks has been much more muted. Now in terms of the the German DAX, we've seen a little bit of a rebound at the beginning of this week after the declines at the end of last week. You can see that here, Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So um, on the Monday, we saw a fairly decent rebound after the declines that we saw at the um, end of last week. And we look as if we probably will finish this week in positive territory, um, notwithstanding today's non-farm payrolls report, which is due out after I've recorded, uh, finished recording this particular video. In terms of the trade picture um, and the economic data picture more broadly, um, US data has actually improved after the scare that we saw at the end of last week, particularly around the jobs market. Um, weekly jobless claims came in at 1.18 million, dropping from 1.4 million. The big question is, will that Will that um, decline in weekly jobless numbers be sustained into August once the enhanced employment benefit of $600 a week rolls off? That expired on the 31st of July. Currently, US lawmakers show no indications whatsoever of replacing that with anything else. So there's a little bit of a cliff edge there in respect of there will, no, there will be no enhanced unemployment benefit checks um, for US furloughed workers or unemployed workers in the absence of a new stimulus plan going forward. So all eyes will be on Washington and Capitol Hill um, and um, whether or not um, the Democrats and the Republicans can see past their ideological differences to try and put together some form of stimulus plan to cushion the blow of the loss of that $600 a week payment. Um, and that, in that context, this week's weekly jobless claims numbers are likely to be very instructive in that regard. Um, and they, they are due out on the 13th of August. We've also got US retail sales coming out on the Friday, the 14th of August. And again, that will be instructive in the context of the slowdown that we've seen in US economic data and the lockdowns or the, the, re, the tightening of restrictions across the Sunbelt states that we saw um, put, put, you know, put together in July. Now in terms of equity markets more broadly and in Europe, 
we've seen a decent rebound of the 200 day moving average for the DAX. Certainly the most recent Germany trade data um, for June it was very positive, but you would expect it to be given the fact the German economy was only just coming out of lockdown. And as such, you would expect there to be a significant rebound, not only import data, but export data as well. So that's encouraging. Um, but again, that data is two months old. So the big question is then, um, will that be will that be sustained into July and August? And to be quite honest, there's no there's no real way of telling against a backdrop of rising infection rates now in Europe, particularly Spain and Italy, and isolated um, isolated lockdowns in certain parts of Germany as well. So I think you also have to be cognizant of the fact that when you see these rising infection rates, while the headline number may be eye-catching, the reason you're seeing higher infection rates is because there's more tests being done. So you're likely to see higher rates of infection, even though the death rate is falling. So I think it's important that when you see these headlines about rising infection rates, you need to factor in how many people are dying as a result of COVID-19, but also how many more people are being tested, because it, it, it all ties in to the overall picture. And just because there's more infections doesn't necessarily mean that um, you're going to get um, significant a rowing back of restrictions. But we've certainly seen that here in the UK. The Prime Minister Johnson has rolled back the reopening of nail bars, bowling alleys, um, as a result of concerns about rising infection rates here in the UK. So that could well act as a drag going forward. And it's certainly a big week for UK data as well as US data. So so let's let's have let's have a quick look at the FTSE 100 first and foremost. Um, again, looks like we're going to see a positive week, not quite reversing the losses of the previous week, but nonetheless, we do appear to have stabilized um, just above 5,900. We come back. The big worry I have about this particular index is the lack of really impulsive move through 6,300. That's a really big top there, and it's proving to be a very, very difficult nut to crack. Having said that, the fact that we weren't able to sustain the move below 5,900 is encouraging on the margins, but we have seen significant underperformance on the back of the FTSE, largely I think as a result of the fact that the pound has managed to consolidate a foothold above 130, and that is um, acting as a little bit of a break um, on the dollar denominated earners in the FTSE 100. So um, let's move on to the cable. As we can see from this chart here, we've seen a decent move to the upside, we're running into a bit of a wall at 132. Also happens to coincide with these March highs here, but also these peaks in January as well, around about 132.20. So you've got a big, got a tough nut to crack there. But if we basically drill down into this data here, 130 or 129.80 is acting as a decent area of support. These long shadows on these two candles here that I'm highlighting suggest that there is a little bit of pent up demand on the back of this weaker dollar. Now, obviously, yield differentials have eroded um, away from the dollar, and that has helped, and that has helped exacerbate the seventh, the seventh successive weekly decline in the greenback um, that we've seen over the course of the past few weeks. But there does appear to be some evidence of a little bit of a rebound in the dollar at the moment, um, and as such, I'd be very, very cautious about being overly long sterling anywhere near 132, unless we get a really impulsive move through here which is going to take us back to the highs that we saw in december around about 136 and we've also got the fact this is showing as a little bit overbought so we've seen the bank of england the bank of england was probably not as dovish as it could have been but nonetheless i think there is some skepticism about the bank of england's forecast for the uk economy going forward and ultimately that's all they are forecasts and the Bank of, England, Bank of England's prediction record hasn't been particularly great. There's also the fact that we've got some very important second quarter GDP numbers out on the 12th of August, along with um, some manufacturing and industrial production numbers for June, um, as well as unemployment and jobless claim numbers for June and July. So the 11th, Tuesday the 11th, Wednesday the 12th, are likely to big day, be big days for 
the UK economy. But again, and I've said this before, they're very much backward looking. So let's start and look at the UK economy. But we do really need to basically put any drop in second quarter output in context of the drops in second quarter output that we've seen from the likes of Spain, Italy, France and Germany. Spain saw a second quarter output drop of 18.5%. Germany saw a more modest 10.1% drop in output, while the US saw a quarterly drop in output of 9%. So the UK estimate is going to be anywhere between 15 and 25%. That's not going to be a surprise. It's going to be bad. The big question is how quickly can the UK economy recover that lost output? And that remains the big unknown. Um, certainly in terms of industrial production and manufacturing output, we did see strong rebounds in May of 8.4 and 6% in terms of manufacturing and industrial production. That hopefully will have continued in June. If it does, then this preliminary GDP number could well be as worse as it gets, and you could actually see subsequent upward revisions. So anywhere between minus 15 and minus 25, the consensus is um, anywhere between that number, because if we look at the monthly numbers, we saw a 20.4% fall in April and a 1.8% gain in May. June should be better than that which would suggest that over the course of the last three months, that anything below 20% and anywhere close to 15 is probably likely to be a fairly decent number, minus 15, I would say. So anywhere mid-teens, you know, I'd take that, given the, given the slowness that some of these lockdown measures um, being eased has taken. Let's not forget it wasn't until the middle of June that um, non-essential shops were allowed to reopen. In terms of UK unemployment, um, the ILO measure really isn't worth the paper it's written on. Um, it's been at 3.9% for the last three months and um, really doesn't account, take into account uh, the number of workers that have been put on to furlough. So it's really about the weekly jobless claims numbers. And in, in June, these came in around about 7.3%. So certainly be looking for a further fall in those numbers in the July numbers. I think in terms of the overall numbers, to get a better idea of what the jobs picture looks like in the UK economy is comparing the number of people on the payroll before March and the number of people on the payroll now. Now this was 660,000 people lower in the June numbers than it was in May. So that gives you an indication of the hit to the labour market as a result of the lockdowns. So in terms of the July numbers, that will be another decent comparative when it comes to estimating how many more people have returned to the workforce. And we've seen certainly seen an awful lot of negative headlines about thousands of job losses from companies that have decided that there's no point in keeping these people on furlough because there's very little chance that they're going to get their jobs back when normal service resumes. So that's the pound. Um, does look a little bit negative at the moment, um, certainly in terms of this daily candle which would seem to suggest we may get a fall back towards 130 and a retest perhaps of 127.60 as the dollar recovers some of that lost ground. Certainly in terms of euro sterling, we're seeing a little bit of weakness there as well. Um, it's finding a decent area of support through 89.80. That's really the big level for euro sterling. If we don't fall below 89.80 anytime soon, then the likelihood is we could go back and retest these peaks back up here just below 92 between 91.30 and 91.75. So keep an eye on that. But if we do break below 89.80, then we could see a sharp move towards 88 and 87. Euro dollar also showing a little bit of weakness. It's amazing how similar this particular chart looks in the, in the context of the cable chart. Finding the areas a little bit thin, anywhere above 119. Personally, I think the euro dollar should not be this high. Um, I think the likelihood is a bit like cable, we could see a fall back um, below these lows that we saw um, earlier this week, around about 116.80, um, which was the lows on Monday. If we fall below 116.80, then we could see a drift back towards the 50-day moving average um, over the course of the next 
few days. Um, what we're also keeping an eye out for this week is obviously US retail sales. Um, that's going to be a fairly decent bellwether of how confident the US consumer is relative to the lockdowns or the re-lockdowns and the new restrictions that came in in July. We've seen pretty much a V-shaped recovery in those retail sales numbers, but I think expectations for July are likely to need to be tempered quite a bit. Expecting to still see a positive number of 1.4%. However, I think there's a good chance that this might be a little bit on the optimistic side, given the recent sharp falls in consumer confidence we've seen for that same month. And those numbers are out on Friday. Um, earlier, this, earlier today, we saw the latest Chinese trade numbers for July. Um, once again, a little bit disappointing. Imports um, fell short of expectations, and that would suggest to me that internal demand continues to remain a little bit on the light side. Retail sales and industrial production for July, again on the Friday. Um, one thing that I think has struck me about this recent Chinese retail sales data is how weak it's been relative to where it was a year ago. Um, you know, ever since the lockdown was eased, We've seen declines of minus 7.5, minus 2.8, and minus 1.8 between April and June. Um, expectations for July are for a measly gain of 0.2%. That still suggests to me that even though the industrial side of the Chinese economy has recovered or appears to have recovered, because certainly demand for oil and other raw materials has bounced back quite nicely, the same can't be said for consumption. Um, that combined with the fact that President Trump has announced bans on TikTok and um, WeChat, which is owned by Chinese company Tencent. I think what I'll be looking for with respect to the July numbers, that um, we need to get an idea of whether or not these retail sales numbers tally with this week's latest market updates from the likes of Tencent and Alibaba because they are both set to re report to the market um, this week as well. And that should give us a better insight into consumer spending patterns of the Chinese consumer. Chinese retail sales data or any sort of Chinese data, you can always argue it may be, it may not tell the whole picture. It's much more difficult to fudge data from Chinese e-commerce companies like Tencent and Alibaba. So I think they could be a much better bellwether or indicator of what the Chinese consumer is doing than the actual government official data. So let's get, we'll certainly be keeping an eye on that going forward. In terms of the earnings picture, if I quickly look at this week's um, earnings announcements, we have got, um, we've got Intercontinental Hotels, Prudential and Lyft. Those are the three that stand out. Wouldn't be our weekly market update we'd look in, without looking at gold. More record highs this week. Um, I've written about that um, on the news and analysis section of the CMC Markets website and its relationship with silver and the prospect for further gains there. But certainly, I think what we're seeing at the moment is it's looking a little bit overextended, but I would still expect to see it to go higher now that we've broken above the previous record highs of 1920. Any dips are likely to find support in and around that area there, um, but in the short to medium term, the trend is your friend and it's pretty much the same for silver prices as well but the likelihood is that we could see we could well see a move towards thirty dollars in the not too distant future in terms of the companies that are reporting as i say three stand out intercontinental hotels um, they own holiday inn and crown plaza and obviously they haven't had the best of time. In its last quarter, revenue per room was down 24.9% as a result of the various lockdown restrictions. Airlines also have been hammered as well, but I think what we've seen from hotels is they've managed to hold up better than airlines simply because I think um, even if you can't get international travel, you should be able to get at least some income from your domestic market. So the big question that we need to ask ourselves as we look towards the second half of the year, because this will be the first half numbers of Intercontinental Hotel, is 
how what sort of improvements have they seen in the greater china region because obviously greater china has been open an awful lot longer certainly in terms of the us um, they expected revenue per run to be down 75 percent year on year and 52 percent down on the first half so i'll be interested to see whether or not they come in close to those expectations um, in terms of the actual key levels on that you can see that there 34.73 intercontinental hotels we've also got prudentials asset manager and reinsurer prudential had a little bit of a weak rebound again as significant exposure to the chinese market and in may prudential said that asia sales had seen a 24 percent fall year on year to the problems due to the problems in china and hong kong be interesting to see whether or not we've seen a rebound in that though management i think have played down expectations of what to expect in q2 um, in july um, prudential also completed 500 million dollar equity investment by Athene Life into its US business. Um, it's divested its UK operations. So really what happens in Asia and what happens in the US is particularly important for this particular um, asset manager and reinsurer here. Last but not least, in light of Uber's results earlier this week, people will be looking for Lyft's results to see how much of a hit their revenues took as a result of the shutdowns that we saw um, in the first quarter of this year active riders in april fell by 75 percent for lift so um, it'll be instructive to see how much of that they've managed to recover in may and june so um as i say i don't know what the um non-farm payrolls number will be like um when this as, I say, as i'm recording this prior to the payrolls number the expectation is of around about one and a half million new jobs and adp disappointed earlier this week 167,000, only against an expectation of about one and a half million but off saying that there was a two million upward revision to the june number so you know on horses for courses on the balance of probabilities is actually better than expected over a two-month period even if the july number was disappointing so um you know, i think the big question as we look forward is how much disruption will there be as a result of some of the lockdowns that we saw in July, this July payrolls number probably won't reflect that given the fact that it only goes up to 14th of July. So we'll probably see the full effect of that in the August numbers. In any case, um, in the meantime, I'd just like to thank you all for your company today. Uh, thank you very much for listening and hopefully you all have a good weekend and I'll speak to you all same time, same place, a week from now. Thank you very much for listening.